Welcome back to the show, everyone. Welcome back to News Talk. Joining us now here on the program, Glenn Ivey. Mr. Ivey served eight years as Prince George's County's top prosecutor. He was the state's attorney in Upper Marlboro. He's now an attorney in private practice. He's running for the House seat, currently held by fellow Democrat Donna Edwards. Welcome back. You've got your legal analyst hat and your green tie <laughs> on the St. Patrick's, Patrick's Day. Yes. Uh, good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you very much for your time today. We've got a, a lot of legal issues. We'll discuss this segment and uh, next, and it's a pleasure to have you here to talk about all of these kind of fascinating topics. Let's begin with the nomination of uh, Merrick Garland. He's on the uh, U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia now. Every time there's been, not every time, but the last couple times, particularly in the Obama presidency, when there's been an opening on the Supreme Court, Merrick Garland's name has come up, at least in the media, Absolutely. as, a, as somebody who's on the short list. Yep. This time, he was the person that at the end of the process, the president said, this is the person who is and his phrase, I think, yesterday was uniquely qualified to serve immediately. What yeah. can you tell us about Merrick Garland? Well, Chief Judge Garland has, um, you know, all the right credentials. The Harvard Law School graduate, he was Harvard Law Review, uh, did uh, the, the right federal clerkships, uh, was a partner at one of the top law firms in, uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, served in the Department of Justice during the Oklahoma bombing uh, case and, and did a stellar job by all accounts, uh, and then was elevated to the court. Uh, I think he got like it's like 76 votes or so, and he's been the chief judge now on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. I, I think he's 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 a he's a candidate there. With, there are no real holes in, in uh, his resume. Very um, very meritorious. You hear the term moderate uh, yeah. used frequently. These things can be tough to peg. Do you get why that label is is placed? Uh, at least in the media, on Judge Carlin? Yeah, I think he was, you know, he's been regarded over the years as, as sort of a centrist uh, from a legal standpoint, uh, and not not so much in the political sense of it, but not really advocating some of the, 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 the positions that are tend to be linked with conservative or liberal uh, judging. Uh, and I think that's part of why he's such a strong candidate here. I, it'll be hard for the Republicans to say he's you know, some sort of a judge with a liberal agenda or trying to move a, a specific agenda forward. It's just not reflected in either his career or his, uh, his time on the bench. This process is always so important because you're talking about nine people who will decide the weightiest issues of the, of the, to of, of, of the day. Uh, there are only nine. They serve uh, until death if they choose. Uh, this one was different because the president and his team knew going in that they faced an unusual political environment in the Senate, given the statements in the immediate aftermath of Ju Justice Scalia's death, that any Obama nominee would be would not be considered at right. all. Right. Uh, do, do you think when you think about Garland, these uh, verse in, in contrast with some of the other names that were out there? Did he pick Garland in part because of the unusual situation? I'm, you know, I'm not sure. I think you know there there are other strong candidates out there for 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 sure. Uh, but I think Chief Judge Garland is uh, uh, a candidate who's going to be difficult for Republicans to attack on the merits, uh, and I think that may be certainly part of the reasoning behind it. Uh, personally, I you know I know the man, and my heart goes out to him a little bit because I think he stepped into a process here where. You know, his he's he may not get judged on the merits. There's a lot of politics here, unfortunately. So you know, close and yet so far. Yeah, they're refusing to even. Some of these guys are refusing to even meet with him. The the Republican leader, Mitch McConnell, says he you know there's no use in even talking uh, with you about this. We're not going to go forward with hearings, much less a confirmation. But what, what do you make of that? Given his qualification, what do you make of the refusal to meet with, or hold hearings, or vote on this nomination? Well, I think it lays bare the political agenda that Republicans have. I mean, admittedly, this is a key uh, seat on the Supreme Court. It could be very pivotal. Uh, but at the same time, you know, under the Constitution, the president gets to nominate. The Senate's supposed to hold hearings and make their decision on, from the advice and consent standpoint. You know, uh, there's certainly plenty of time to get this done. Usually these appointments, the, the whole process will take 60, 75 days, somewhere in that range. Um, so just to refuse to even meet with him uh, entirely is problematic. If there's not intense public pressure, I, I would think that if there's not intense public pressure on the Senate leadership and other members who are supporting leadership to say no meeting, no hearing, no vote, this, this is how it will be but, uh, until th either the lame duck or we have a new president. Is that your expectation, that uh, the status quo will hold and Garland will not make it to the bench? 
Well, I think it's, it remains to be seen. Uh, you know, a lot of, there's going to be a lot of pressure. I think the Republicans have like 24 seats up uh, for re-election this year in the Senate. Uh, the Democrats have, I believe, 10. Uh, and some of those seats the Republicans are going to have to defend are going to be a real challenge. And this is the kind of thing that makes it harder for those Senate Republicans to defend getting reelected uh, because it's pretty obvious they're not doing the job they were sent there to do in refusing to even talk to the guy. So you've had some Republicans break already on those grounds. And you've got some moderate Republicans like Susan Collins from Maine mm -hmm. who's already said that uh, you know, she's definitely willing to meet with him and thinks he should get a hearing. Let's shift gears for a couple minutes. We'll carry this over into the next segment if need be. I thought it was fascinating, given the tumultuous uh, rally that Donald Trump, uh, he's had a couple tumultuous rallies. He had to cancel one. And for a brief period, there was a, a person uh, in the job, similar to what you, the one you held, who it, it, it became publicly known that he was considering whether incitement to riot charges should be filed against Donald Trump or his campaign or what have you, given the words and then the actions that followed. Can you talk briefly about that uh, plank of our law and what, what a prosecutor would have to do to make, to have a go at something like that? Sure. And, you know, it varies from state to state because different states have different laws, but all of them are governed by the First Amendment. So every, especially candidates are, you know, protected by the First Amendment, right to speak and say things that are on their mind. Uh, and sometimes even if it's reprehensible speech, it's still protected by the First Amendment. That sort of pushes up against, was he saying things that caused, uh, you know, the violent attack that happened at the riot? Um, and I, I think this prosecutor looked at it and decided, you know, it's a steep mountain to climb to prove uh, incitement uh, because you've got to go a long ways to get there uh, and get it out of the zone of being protected by First Amendment uh, right to uh, free speech uh, to the point where you can criminally prosecute it. Not to say it's not worth some caution if you're a candidate prone to the sorts of statements that Mr. Trump is clearly prone to. Well, he's clearly left the zone of irresponsible and he's, you know, like in, in reprehensible, I think, with, with a lot of these comments. And that was another example of that. Um, you know, I know the Republican Party's trying to rein him in uh, for a variety of reasons. I hope they can do a better job. More of our conversation with legal analyst Glenn Ivey on air and online at news8newstalk.com. We'll step aside here, back with more of the program for you right after this.